then on the other hand, uh, uh, there's about 50-50 of that. You know? And and uh, I mean, why should we be condescending to anyone? Because I think uh, we just um, want to be loved all the time. Uh, I find that kind of attitude condescending anyway. You don't have to say thank you, especially when you love something. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, in certain parts of the, of the show, I mean, you seem to be going almost completely the other way. I mean, there's almost a sort of perverse desire to go to the opposite extreme at times. Yeah, but we, yeah, we've, uh, yeah, perverse is the right word. We've, we've often done the opposite of what we should have at the time. And sometimes it's been uh, tantamount to commercial suicide. Currently, you, the music you're playing is a lot different to the stuff you started out as. Do you ever feel in danger of alienating that very hardcore of Stranglers fans? Uh, for sure, yeah. So, I mean, does that worry you? It doesn't, well, no, we, we, as I said before, we've never gone out of our way to, to patronise or condescend to anyone. And uh, uh, some, if you're talking about hardcore, some of them have, have also evolved with us too. You know. It'd be a shame if uh, they had stuck in a groove, whereas uh, we haven't. Ah, but some people still are stuck in a groove, aren't they? Because, I mean, uh, well, again, something that Hugh Cornwell said last night, I mean, people were spitting, which was a sort of 1976 thing, and he was making a point of that, that, yeah. that those people were stuck in 1976. So does yeah. that worry you, or does, it, does that surprise you? Um, well, it depends how old they are. I mean, if they're, if it's the first gig they've been to, I mean, I, if they were 14, 15-year-olds and they felt that that was what they had to do, you know, exchange, uh, exchange spit, then, uh, uh, yeah, they, you know, they're reading living history aren't they but uh, if they're if they're in their 20s you know and uh, they were doing that five years ago then it's, uh, it's pretty sad yeah so you don't enjoy being spat on um, shall i try it with you yeah hey? see how you like it um no if you see me walking down the streets and i start to cry each time we meet walk on by Was the change in, uh, in in the music of the Stranglers, was that a very intentional move? I mean, did you sit down and, and decide that you had to change, that or else you would be at risk of getting stuck in a rut? Not, we didn't decide we had to change, although, um, uh, I mean, change for change's sake is a bit of a, a bit negative, actually, but certainly we were aware that uh, we mustn't uh, repeat ourselves, certainly. When Golden Brown came out, that was the first hit you'd have for for a little while anyway. It had been quite a lean period by the Stranglers' terms. They'd always had quite a lot of hit singles. But when Golden Brown came out, um, I think a lot of people were surprised when they heard, sort of heard it on the radio and then heard that it was the Stranglers at the end of yeah, it. Was, was, was that intentional? Well, I was surprised to hear it on the radio as well. It wasn't something that people, in, you know, record company people who, who one must assume don't know anything about music. But one, we always work from that. Premiers, anyway, they don't know anything about music, right? and uh, uh, it when something is not obvious to them, you know, they um, they can't see its potential. So uh, so eventually, people um, kind of subvert them, convince them that something they should release something. It, it, you know, it's like uh, throwing uh, proverbial mud at them. Or, you know, sometimes it works, it sticks, and sometimes it doesn't. Texture like sun lays me down with my mind. She runs throughout the night. No need to fight, never a frown with golden brown. the Stranglers continuing preoccupation with black about clothes and album sleeves and everything which is something you've sort of followed from the very early days well black is, has got so much depth to it I mean it's it's uh, it's it's so many things everything is in black um, it's total absence of color it's also to all the colors you know so it uh, on, on a just on a conceptual level it's um, it contains the, the germs of everything, you know, all ideas, and uh, well, it's the only, it's the only, it's the only thing I have in my wardrobe anyway. <laughs> 
Let's talk more about the the new LP, the latest LP, Feline. Was it intentional to sort of give it um, a feel of sort of travel or, or a, a very European feel? Because I mean that's something that you had uh, in your solo album was Euro Man Cometh, and there's a, I mean the single is European female, but there's a lot of sort of travel imagery on this album. Yeah, yeah, um, there is, and there there is a, a, an, a European element to it, uh, which I don't think is a bad thing as far as we're concerned. I consider myself to be a European, a white European. That's what I am. Um, I can't change that. And uh, even it's, it's, in in Britain, uh, people kind of confuse the idea of Europe with the common market, which is which is a crazy thing to do. It's, it's a narrow thing to do because the common market affects us uh, in many ways badly, just because of the whole bureaucratic setup and everything. And uh, also, some of the decisions uh, seem dumb, right? Uh, so they they see the EC as as Europe, which is not, because the EC is a, is a, a political and economic setup, which is maybe uh, in in <coughs> with uh, in retrospect again, uh, uh, we, we've, with hindsight, we'll see it as be, having been uh, one of the elements towards the unification of Europe which at this moment in time seems to be uh, becoming increasingly important as a, as a concept because when you think about uh, the world is going towards continent continentalism you have you know, South America is, is getting itself a bit more together uh, North America, I mean even though Canadians might not consider themselves to be North Americans or they, they are, you know, they're under that umbrella, North uh, American umbrella. You have the Soviet Union, another block, and you have the weedy little Europeans in the middle where this is where they want to blow, you know, this is where they want to put all the missiles and fight their macho games. This is where they want to play. You know, they, we're the sort of the cannon fodder, so to speak. And imagine if uh, you're united, you know, there was the United States of Europe, you know, every country was still, um, it had its own identity, but in a federal union, it would be the most powerful unit on the world, on the globe, you know. I knew she was a female, she moved with his embrace, her green eyes were a mystery, no emotion on her face, female she Feline's base, uh, I mean, just the word uh, describes uh, a cat. You know, a cat. Uh, a cat doesn't um, very controlled movements. A cat. You know, it's a very muscular animal. There's no, sorry, there's no excess baggage, no excess meat. On the, on this is a fat cat. But most cats are very efficient. They're stealthy, they, you know, and uh, they're powerful without being obvious about it. Do you think the stranglers are in a very secure? position now because it seems that I mean certainly fashion plays no part in the stranglers anymore does it well it never has fortunately because I mean imagine uh, people uh, imagine being this month's fashion if you're this month's fashion uh, by, by necessity next month you're last month's fashion right and that's kind of it seems to be uh, we live in a disposable enough uh, situation especially I mean with regards to music and that. Uh, even more so in this country that uh, uh, I hate the idea of anything that I'm involved with being disposable. I mean, most people are the same, but they'll, for a quick buck, they'll um, they'll become disposable objects. Well, you know, I just don't think that. So um, it's kind of it's kind of satisfying to see all these people come and go who've jumped on bandwagons or whatever, uh, and we created our own bandwagon. You know? So that's kind of a strong situation to be in. Do you ever get smug about the way the audience is treated? I mean, because you said that that sort of, all right, adulation, we won't use that word because you don't like that. <laughs> well, but I mean, that's what it seems like. I mean, it, it is adulation in a way, because adulation is when it doesn't really matter what the band plays, they're going to get the same reaction anyway. And I think the Stranglers are, slight, are slightly like that. I, I, thought, I felt the same thing with Bruce Springsteen, that it's a sort of, before it starts, everybody knows what they're going to do. The, the, the crowd are packed to the doors and they're going to go wild no matter what the Stranglers do. People who come to see the Stranglers are pretty smart people. They, um, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, in this day and age, you don't pay £4.50 for, you know, for 
for a, a fart, you know. Ah, oh, but if you pay four pounds fifty, you're determined to enjoy yourself, no matter what happens on the stage. Well, this, yeah, this is. A, I, I've, I've often heard this. Hey, we've paid our money, and uh, I insist on being entertained. Entertain me. We talk about condescension. Isn't the all sort of uh, generalisation about northern people and, and using that accent? Isn't that condescending? No, it's meant to be a wind up, actually. <laughs> Woke up on a good day, and the world was wonderful. A midnight summer dream had me in its spell. I read it. Mark Ratcliffe talking there to Jean-Jacques Burnell of The Stranglers, and that track was Midnight Summer Dream from The Stranglers' new album, Feline. Well, that's it. Here we are again. You didn't recognise me with the hair, did you? No, but I've been told, I've been told that blondes have much more fun. One thing I did notice is the um, the seven-inch version of Shaking Like a Leaf. It's not as good as the twelve-inch version. Is Laurie Latham's producing it yeah. now? I remember you saying last time that in the middle of recording the current album, you went on holiday to quote you. Well, yeah. So how we come you got back with him? Well, we didn't. It, this was one of the things that we had kept from the the original recording sessions, and um, since we don't choose what a, what's going to be a single anymore, because frankly we, we don't really got no idea what a single should be, mm. so we let the record company choose, and they um, quite rightly I think, because in the old days we used to choose singles, and we just didn't have any idea. Of, you know, sometimes they'd be really obscure. Yeah. And since we, I mean, all this, all the tracks we record, we we actually believe in. So I mean, mm. we just give them a choice, and they they did have with this track a choice of a few mixes. One having been Laurie Latham's. Mm. That was done sort of way back? Well, was this was done in the original right? sessions, Dreamtime sessions, yeah, which yeah. we cancelled. Uh, how come, I mean, uh, this shows how thick people in Britain are. Why wasn't Big well, in they America don't have, they don't have a on huge them. hit? <laughs> well, first and of all... one of the most amazing videos ever. Well, first of all, I don't think uh, people in Britain have got a monopoly on, on thickness, but if it comes to, when you're talking about music, well, the British are quite uh, peculiar in that they're very fad, fad orientated. Yeah. So um, it's uh, it's understandable that a band which is not the latest fad um, uh, doesn't do so well in, in singles. Anyway, certainly in singles. And um, there's sort of an inbuilt, uh, there's an inbuilt thing in, in Britain that uh, prejudice that after two or three albums you can't be in, in you know, you've reached your peak, you know, you mm. can't be any good. Yeah. So they don't give much credit for people maybe developing um, uh, their craft or whatever, or, mm. or maybe having learning, having more, even more to say the older they get, because you know, that's not allowed in the in this inbuilt prejudice. But that's, I think, that's peculiar to Britain. Do you think there's, there's still any of the old tags of, of the, the late 70s still sticking with you? I mean, a lot of people have said to me, oh, God, JJ, what a thug. He goes around beating people up all the time. Well, I mean, are these stigmas from when you were, like, in 77, 78? I mean, they still sticking with you and happening? Well, so very, um, th they are in, in Britain, uh, not in other countries, but certainly in Britain it's a bit of a, ha a handicap. I mean, if I did go around like that I'd have I wouldn't be able to teach karate I'd have my license taken away from me and um, uh, we wouldn't be playing we wouldn't be allowed to play anywhere I mean okay I don't get invited to many parties these days because they always expect me to, to do what I used to do which would be either vomit on the floor <laughs> on the walls and uh, be embarrassingly um, uh, forward with the hostess and get thrown out or end up in a mass pound shop. But um, I don't quite do that these days. I let, I let the younger ones do that. On to the tour then. Tonight's the first night. You're playing, what, about a dozen dates, isn't it? Yeah, about in Britain, that. yeah. Yeah. 
then uh, then off to the good old US of A. Yeah. You said that you, you've chosen some of the smaller venues that you haven't played at for ages. What was the sort of thinking behind that? Well, we we wanted to um, we wanted to do this Dreamtime tour, as we're calling it, uh, in two parts. First part, which was before Christmas, which would be the major cities, the normal places. And then we wanted also to do places we haven't been to um, for years, for quite a while, because it's it's really easy to to, to do uh, to play. You can play NEC, the SEC, Wembley, and that's it. And that's your British tour. And I think we're the, one of the few bands who can sell out everywhere, mm. who are still doing it and enjoying it. I mean, if we did it year in year out, it might be a pain in the butt. But uh, as it is, it, it's, you know, it's a one-off sort of thing, and um, it's very enjoyable. Into the 13th year of being together, does it seem Nearly. like it? No, it doesn't, because um, things have changed so much. I mean, musically, we've changed, we're changing all the time, and um, we even are, are live, we've got a totally different lineup. I mean, with the brass and everything, it's, it gives us a lot more potential. On this tour, are you still using brass to light enhance some of the older tracks? Yeah, sure, yeah. But yeah, I mean, given you lease a life, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, are you, I mean, basically, is is this like the tour you were doing in the last year, part two? Is yeah, it, it is. Like yeah. the same lineup, the same songs? A few new songs, but, um, well, a few old songs, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's more or less, it's part two, I think. Last time when we were talking to you in Birmingham, you were saying that so you didn't, although on this album you didn't have a particular favourite track, Too Precious was one that you really enjoyed playing. Uh, yeah, but you haven't played that to date, are you playing that? No, on this we haven't, at all? Um, because we decided that um, it would be too far removed from the album version of what we were playing. I, I still disagree with that, but I mean, you've got to respect another person's view in the band. I mean, Jeff, because there, there was a lot of additional percussion in it, so and it's quite a jazzy number. I had a dream of a nightmare. It's the first night of the tour. Do you still get any of the old? the um, traditional first night hitches but or is it a case of after playing together for so long you've virtually got it all straight and now you well, actually no um, we have, have actually played three dates before this last three nights just small secret ones well they weren't so secret they were people you know head was sticking through the walls and everything it was, it was a bit hot and sweaty but it was uh, good fun <laughs> So what about for the future? I mean, you know, we know you're off to America, what, uh, middle of April, will that be now? Yeah, for a month. About a month. Yeah. How's it going over there? I know always the sun is now finally charging. Yeah, it's starting to, we're starting to do well there, you yeah, know, um, we'll, we'll see. Then, after that, maybe some new recording? Have you got any new stuff well, lined up yet, or has it I've sort got of been that busy in the last six months or so to think about that? Yeah, and frankly, I wouldn't want to think too much too far ahead because that kind of compromises you, doesn't it? You start making career moves and start doing things in the best interests, so-called, of, of your career and all that. And um, I think you lose some of the um, spontaneity, which has been uh, one of the features of Strangers. I mean, you know, it's been long-term. Have you got any particular tracks over the last ten albums or so that you've recorded that really mean a lot to you? Uh, well, most of them have meant something to me at one point or another. Um, no more, no less than that. I mean, I, you know, I defend them if they were living persons, so, which they do have some kind of life to them as far as we're concerned. I'm sure anyone who writes their own ditty or own poem or painting feels hurt when someone knocks it, but obviously we, we get quite a lot of that. But um, if you're going to play a track, play Was It You? In time, Old Master Stranglers and Was It You. In the middle we heard a bit of Two Precious, and at the beginning I was... No by now, shaking like a leaf. Uh, many, many thanks to Jojo for taking the time out to speak to us. The only problem is, you see, they've got me some... some, some backstage passes and things like that to go to the gig on Preston on Friday night when I've got me night off. But the snag is... I've got to buy him all a drink! Oh no! It's 9.26. 2,000 times louder than any you idiots, alright? However loud you shout, SHUT UP, BUNCH OF MORONS! THE FUTURE OF BITTEN, BAH! Hmm, Hugh Cornwall, good evening.
Oh, uh, you've got a, such a way with words with audiences, haven't you? I'd forgotten completely about that. Where did you find that little morsel? That's um, uh, that's on the uh, the evening with Hugh Cornwall on the um, the official bootleg of Shaking Like a Lion. Oh, that thing, yeah, yeah. How do we know that thing? Well, I did my darndest to stop that coming out. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, in that case, I'll burn my copy if you'd prefer. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, first thing I'd like to ask you, you've just uh, recently completed quite an extensive tour of the States. Yeah, five um, weeks. Yeah, that must have been hard work. It um, was, yeah, but it's uh, more encouraging than the other tours we've done there. It was quite satisfying because it was... Um actually getting somewhere now. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of people I've spoken to have said they reckon it's your most successful tour of there so far. Oh, you bet, yeah. Just the, uh, the Americans finally waking up to the Stranglers. Well, it's remarkable because about 90% of the people that come to see us and they hear about us now in America think that this is our first, Dreamtime's our first LP. No. And then they meet Jet and they, wa- they, they wonder, you know. Mm. Um, but, um, so that's very encouraging. It just shows you how big a place America is and... Mm. And that really is true, about 90%, so it's quite amazing, you know. Yeah, because I've got a, a friend who comes from the States who says that the problem with the country, that it being so big, he says you've got a sort of massive followings in certain states, and other states, you know, the Stranglers, who? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I hear um, Jet wasn't too well. Is he repaired now? He's say? fine now, yeah. he's um, He took a week off, and a friend of ours called Robert Williams, who I did some recording with about uh, eight years That's ago. That's right, good old Nosferatu. Yeah, Captain Beefheart's drummer. He, he flew out uh, at 48 hours notice and uh, and uh, and filled in for Jet for a week, which was great. And so when we got to LA, we to thank him, he came on and did a couple of uh, the encore numbers with us. You know, mm. Jet let him play, which I thought was really nice of Jet. <laughs> yeah. To thank him, you know, for filling in. He did really well. Well, it's nice to have influential friends who can just sort of Jet down to you at a couple of hours notice. Isn't well, it? he's a very talented guy. I'm, I hope that it's going to do him, give him some help, you know, in his career himself. Hmm. Of late, there's, um, quite a lot of press has been given to your forthcoming solo LP. That's right, Is yeah. this going to affect the Stranglers in any way? Well, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, I'm sure it'll affect it, you know, <laughs> in the sense that uh, if it's a success, it'll be good for the Stranglers, and if it's not a success, well then, you know, it, that won't affect the, uh, the band, but um, obviously it'll... it'll um, I don't know, it'll make people say, well, you know, you shouldn't go off and do things like that, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, th- that's that's not the way I'm looking at it. You know, I want it to I want it to do well, obviously. Yeah, how did you be get involved with the soundtrack for When the Wind Blows? Well, the first, one of the first things I, d- I recorded for Virgin was a song that I think didn't really turn out that well. It's facts and figures. And so I said, well, I, it's not really what I wanted to do. It's a bit lightweight, a bit bubblegummy, and uh, I don't want to use it on the album. They said, well, it's, we can we use it for a film? So I said, fine, you know. Mm. And it ended up coming out as a single, which I was quite surprised at. Yeah, it, did, it didn't do too badly, really, did well, it? Well, it got a lot of airplay, but um, it, no one went out and bought it. No, I didn't probably know. because they were hearing it too much on the radio. I, they thought I didn't need to. I tell you what, I wouldn't mind a single that goes in at number 61, I tell you. Uh, is that sick. what it did? Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm getting blase in my old age, aren't I? <laughs> I'm not going to quote you on that. But then it went straight out again the next week. I'm saying nothing about that. You've also been recently um, producing one of my favourite bands, that's uh, Ex Mal Deutschland. Well, I just heard today, funnily enough, you should mention that, that they split up. Oh, you're joking? No, I just heard someone told me today. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I'm depressed. I know, it's a shame. Yeah, well, we played Matador earlier on. Oh, did you? Because <laughs> that was the one you produced, wasn't it? That's the, the one, yeah. The I album. wish I could have done some more with them, but I just didn't have the time. Yeah, they do send their regards, by the way. Do they? They, they were um, they were with us not too long ago, shall we say. Yeah, sweet bunch of people. <laughs> what else do you personally do outside the band, sort of keep yourself sane? I mean, we know Dave's got into blimmin' flying of all kind of things, and... Um, well, my, my greatest um, uh, occupation is work, you know, because like, work to me is play. Yeah. I mean, it's real fun, and I'm... I, I tend to, I t- whenever I meet other creative people, not necessarily musicians that I, I get on with or I like their work or I respect as people, then the immediate thought is, well, let's do something together. Mm. So I end up getting involved um, in a lot of projects, you mm. know, and um, so that's what I spend my spare time doing. What, why, why did you actually go into this business in the first place? Because, I mean, you had um, a fairly good job before you started out with the Stranglers, didn't you? Yeah, well, I'd, I was in research in a hospital in Sweden doing a biochemistry research which which is all very well but I suddenly realized I wasn't really cut out for it mm. um, you have to be you have to be much much more patient and uh, diligent than I than I could was capable of mm, that, that it, didn't that didn't in any help any way by any remote chance help with the lyrics to Sweden off black and white did it it might just <laughs> have had a slight slight yes a slight um, 
help there, yeah. <laughs> Another thing I'd like to go on to, over the last sort of, well, was it, was it now coming on 13 years you've been together, 12 and a half, 13 years? Yeah. You've got up to some pretty unusual things, shall we say. Um, I mean, some people may say they were like tongue-in-cheek publicity stunts, if you like. Um, for example, using the, the strippers at Battersea Park, and uh, I heard one escapade of you actually gaffer-taping a journalist to the Eiffel Tower. Well, I mean, have you heard that expression, he asked for it? Yeah. You know, well, excuse me a second. Right. <laughs> well, in this case, I mean, he actually did ask for it. Yeah? Yeah, he had it written all across his face, please gather me up. <laughs> I like to be tied up with sticky tape in high places. So you thought the Eiffel Tower's high enough? Well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, he arranged to, he, he said, why don't we meet there? And so we thought, no problem. <laughs> bring um, your own gaffer tape, it says at the bottom, you know, P.S. bring your own gaffer tape. Yeah. Of, of the things you've got up to, is there, is there looking back anything that you've really thoroughly regretted or on the other hand been totally proud of and thought, well that was an absolute stroke of brilliance? Well being a, being a, just a mere human being, it's um, it, both those, yes to both those questions, you mm. know, and, and on innumerable uh, occasions, I mean I don't think it's possible not to to be honest, uh, for anyone to be honest, for anyone to deny that. Mm. Um, but the things that you regret, you learn from, and the things you're proud of, um, you um, you learn from as well. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's all a big learning experience, you know. Mm. I remember Jet saying once that um, the four of you have a way of, what, what I can't remember his exact words, it was something like um, taking a situation and exploiting it to its full. Yeah, and that, that, so the word exploit isn't necessarily a bad word, it's no, got lots no. of different, um, yeah, I mean, sure. you can exploit your potential, you know, you mm. can, uh, you can, have, uh, it's the sad, one of the saddest things to see is talented people not exploiting their own talent and not doing things that they're talented at, and mm. um, so it's, it's, exploitation is, can be a very creative process. Mm. So presumably at the moment you must be, um, are you putting the finishing touches to the album yet, or has it still got a way to go? What, my album? Yeah. Uh, well, I've done a lot of recording over the past nine months mm. with um, a guy called Ian Ritchie, who produced um, Pete Wiley, he's That's just right, done yeah. Roger Waters' right, uh, yeah. album and he's in hot demand at the moment but um, <laughs> we're going to I'm going to do some more recording uh, in a couple of weeks time it's just you know I've got to be very careful what comes out and um, <laughs> I, I'm getting you know we're just taking it very very slowly and um, we're going to make sure when it's out everyone's totally happy with it good well we wish you the best of luck with that well thanks Chris just hold on hold on there one moment and uh, what we'll do in the meantime this is the track I think you wanted me to play off Dreamtime Mayan Skies any particular reason for that well I've just got back from Mayan Skies. On the way back from America, I took the opportunity to stop off in uh, the Yucatan, which is uh, where the Mayan civilization uh, was seated, and um, spent a few days there. So it's sort of, you know, it's sort of my state of mind at the moment. <laughs> Brilliant. From Dreamtime, Mayan Skies. <laughs> I'm going, before you say anything, yes, I will enjoy staying in Nice. I will enjoy getting the incredible suntan, and I'm not telling you who I'm staying with. <coughs> there ain't many people in Nice, really, that I know that I could stay with, apart from him, really, is there? I'm going to kill him for being late from the airport. All right, that's the lot. We will leave you with the chap's first ever single, Get a Grip on Yourself, from me, Chris Lowe. Take care, look after yourself, don't do anything that I'd like to, and all the best for the future. Ta-ra. Didn't have the money round to buy a Murray Excellent new single there from the Stranglers. Is it? This is a recorded message. <laughs> What's actually kept you together? Money? No, I think it's because we're all such horrible, mean, nasty people. We just <laughs> It's just kept us together. We've never met any... Uh, I haven't met four, three other people. I mean, you've seen what the others look like. <laughs> what? I mean, we are the worst, meanest-looking bunch of creatures you know, that uh, are assembled in the world of sculpture. Well, and, um, there's no other, I don't know three other sculptors who are as mean and as horrible as the other three, and, and you know, I really hate them. But I think it's, it's fair to say that your drummer's the ugliest, right? Jet? Yeah. The ugliest? The ugliest what? A person, a human being, sculpture, whatever you like to call him. Mr. Bates, do you mind? I don't know if he'd like that. Well, no, but he's well away from me at the moment. He had a reputation for a while as well as being a fairly stroppy guy. It just fascinates me, though, you see. I mean, a lot of people who see you on television and hear the stories about you, you produce these beautiful love songs. Uh, really? Yeah, you do. So why not hang around and listen to your own product? Back with you in a minute.
in real trouble because we're late for Newsbeat, but I must ask you, uh, there are rumours flying around that on the new album you've got a computer game, is that right? Tell me all about it. Well, uh, as you might, may or may not know, Dave, our keyboard player, he's into um, crosswords, puzzles. Life is a complete puzzle for Dave. He's, he's, he's a bit, um, we're a bit worried about his mental health actually recently because he's getting so into these um, mm. computer, this new computer craze that he, he's almost um, running his life and brain like a machine. And um, he thought it'd be a very good idea to create a um, computer adventure game, which he's done with a friend of his. And um, it's turned out so well that we've, we've, we've given it away on the cassette of the album. Is it based on The Stranglers? Yes, it's um, the, basically the person who plays the game, I think, travels around the world picking up the pieces of um, a, a sculpture. Mm. And they have to assemble these pieces um, together in London. And they're given clues as to where to go to find the, the different bits and pieces. And, um, and obviously you win it if you win the game, if you... Um if you can assemble all the pieces, find them and, and assemble them and get them back to London. Have you tried it yourself, you? No, I haven't, no. I don't know how to work computers. I, see, I was brought up in an age of cassette recorders, and I can just about... I can work tape recorders, but computers just uh, mystify me. Radio in the morning. To develop a lot of other things as well, and it's just a matter of having the time and, and actually uh, devoting your time to it. Because you can, when you get free time, you can either do sit down in an armchair and watch television, or you can, um, or you can lay in the sun, or you can actually do something different, which and a change is as good as a rest. So you can I develop yourself. A little yeah. Little so way. I'm um, branching out. There's a lovely biography sent out by the book. Oh God. I mean, they're they're always priceless, but this one says that you walk the edge of your art because it's the only place to be. Hey, right on. You know, <laughs> actually, yesterday on round table, you came in for a little bit of stick, didn't you, from um, Morrissey? Oh yeah. Well, I didn't write the biography. I mean, you know, <laughs> Great one. expect the unexpected. I think. Yeah. Yes, I think you ought to send out the biography with every copy of the record. <laughs> more, more importantly, let's listen to the record. This is Hugh Cornwall's uh, new solo thing. This is called One in a Million. from Hugh Cornwall, who is talking to us on Saturday Live. Uh, now, the other side of that solo record, Hugh, is a thing called Siren Song, which I gather comes from the soundtrack of a film. Yeah, it's, um, about that. it's um, a short half-hour film, which, which hasn't been shot yet, but... Uh, the music's ready already. The music's ready, and it's a collaboration uh, that I'm doing with a, fr a French friend of mine in Paris, and he's, uh, he's directing it, and I'm in it, and I'm doing the music as well. You're in the film? Yeah. You're actually going for the acting thing? Because I know sure, you, yeah. you have, uh, is dabbled the wrong word to say, but you have done a bit of acting in the past, haven't you? You've done stage acting, I've read somewhere. Yeah, it's all learning experience, you know, you, you just, uh, everything you get involved in, you learn in an art, and you, get in, uh, you learn, it's like an apprenticeship, so this is another stage in the apprenticeship. What's the appeal? What's the appeal of being on stage or in a film? Oh, it's a good, uh, it's a good feeling. Hard work? Very hard work, yeah, yeah. But very satisfying if you do something good. Have you been actually going out there and practicing, you know, with a video camera at home, looking in the mirror and getting <laughs> moody? And no, you can't do it like that. You've got to actually work in a team of people, the director who says, OK, this is how I want you to do it. And by working with different people, you, you, um, you d discover different things about your, about your abilities as an actor. So um, you, you've been having formal lessons of some kind? Yeah, with, yeah, with the director and also um, uh, appearing in small productions, film productions, very small things. Though. Oh, that's great. Can, can people see these things? Uh, or are you hiding them all? If they pay lots and lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> and send your cheques to you. Call. What sort of parts have you been playing? Because I can imagine you being typecast in the sort of uh, fairly moody mould. You are far from that personality as well. Well, I, I did... Um, I played a 70-year-old man. I had all the makeup uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Holland. You should have taken it off before you came in today. Yes, I know, I should have done. <laughs> and it's quite hot under this uh, wig, actually. And... Um, and uh, before that, I had, to, I had to play a guy who pretended he was, who thought he was, he, he thought he was Frank Sinatra in a bar late at night, and and uh, uh, completely uh, shocked these two uh, drunks in this bar by starting to sing "Don't Worry About Me." Um, that was another one. Um, oh, that's uh, they're quite funny. It's going to be a very much harder job to do the real serious big movie, though, isn't it? When it comes around. 
Yeah, well, that's why this next thing is a very good um, next stage because that is a, it's a serious a serious plot. Um, what sort of part? Without giving away, uh, giving away too much, you know, what yeah. sort of thing are you doing? Well, it's uh, he, he, the director um, stressed very very strongly that to, to me that it's uh, a movie about seduction and uh, it involves the the traditional story of the siren on the beach seducing men and um, capturing them with her song um, and I'm just a poor hapless victim who comes along and gets ensnared and you've got a smile on your face at the moment it sounds really quite interesting it's called uh, well it, it says here bleeding star which is an unusual sort of title yeah well that 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 um, I think is going to, have to change the name because that in French means something different from what it does in English in, in French it means the shape of the star which is when she um, 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 has liaisons with these um, victims. She, uh, with her fingernails, scratches a star on their forehead, which starts to bleed, obviously, mm -hmm. and it's like a scar. Um, but in English, it, it, I think it, it gets misinterpreted. It they they, really mean they much think I am the bleeding star or something. <laughs> the star means something else in. So I've, I, I suggested to him, I think you should change the title in English. Right. Well, enjoy it when it comes up. How are you going to have time to, to work with the Stranglers with all these things going on? Uh, no problem, no really? problem, yeah. What's um, the next thing that happens then for, for the Strangers? We're, we're going into Brussels next uh, month with Laurie Latham again to um, spend three months on a new album. Laurie is a very busy prefer, uh, producer, isn't he? I mean, yeah. goodness me, we just had Squeeze on the show, he was yeah. working on that album. He's just doing Echo and the Bunnymen at the moment. He doesn't seem to stamp his own sound, which is a nice thing. He's, he's able right. to bring out the best of the band. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, I, I seem to be saying everything, so... <laughs> we'll play the music from the film, then. Uh, bleeding star at the moment, or whatever, you know, this when it the comes theme, out. theme, yeah. yeah. This, is, uh, this is actually called Siren. And the B-side of Hugh Cornwall's new single. Hugh, thank you for coming in and listening to me talk to you. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> certainly a long way from Peaches, isn't it? That's Hugh Cornwall's B-side to his new single, uh, music from a film that he's making in the autumn, and that song is called Siren.